Hello, Monetization Nation. When customers have great experiences, they want to buy more and are more loyal. A positive customer experience often results in positive word of mouth referrals. 73% of customers say a good buying experience is key in influencing their brand loyalties. Daniel Burstein is the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Mech Labs Institute. He oversees all content marketing coming from the marketing experiments and marketing Sherpa brands. While helping to shape the marketing directions for Mech Labs Institute, digging for actionable discoveries while serving as an advocate for the audience. Before joining Mech Labs Institute, Daniel was Vice President of Mind Plus Communications, a boutique communications consultancy specializing in IT clients such as IBM, VMware, and BEA systems. Daniel has 21 years of experience in copywriting, editing, internal communications, sales enablement, and field marketing communications. In today's episode, we're going to discuss customer-first marketing and how we can help our customers see the value of our products and services. Tectonic shifts are constantly transforming the earth and business, causing destruction and huge growth opportunities. I'm Nathan William, the host of Monetization Nation, where we learn how to leverage business tectonic shifts to transform monetization. We are super grateful that Daniel is joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me here, Nathan. So we'd like to start off by asking our guests to share something that they are super passionate about so that our audience can get to know them a little bit better. This is a great topic. So I'm passionate about something we call customer first marketing. We've done a lot of research into this. So there are different ways to succeed as a marketer, but from different studies we've done and different research we've done, we found one of the most successful things you can do is put the customer first with your marketing. So a lot of times, you know, some of the things we're working on, we have to ask for a conversion. We have to ask for an action. We're creating a product. So the best thing you could do is go back with your team and we can maybe get more into this later into the interview and ask, what can we do to put our, our customer first? And I know you like stories, so I'll give you a story to explain yes. how this might work in real life, right? Always. So, so I'm married. So let's say I, you know, I'm supposed to take the garbage out every Sunday. And let's say I take it out, you know, 30 Sundays in a row. And on the 31st Sunday, I don't take the garbage out. That's that action. I don't take the garbage out. And so my wife, is she going to get mad at me? Well, she's going to think, well, what's his motivation? He normally does it. He doesn't do it this time. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Let's say same action. I don't take the garbage out on that Sunday, but I never take it out. I always complain about it. It's always an issue. What's going to be her reaction? She's probably going to be, there's going to be a little more friction in our relationship. She's going to be a little more kind of frustrated with me for not, for not doing it. So you can have the same action, but with a different motivation behind it, with a different assumption of a motivation behind it from the person on the other side, they react very differently. So the same is true from, from some research we've done with 2,400 U.S. consumers of how consumers look at our companies. When consumers perceived that they were being put first, their needs and wants were being put first by the company, the company could take the same action as a company where they perceived, you know, the company was more out for themselves, out to take advantage of them. The customers who perceived they were being put first were way more into the company, way more satisfied, way more likely to be repeat customers. So if there's Everything else we talk about, there's one thing you, you leave from this conversation, when it comes down to difficult decisions you and your teams have to make, think, how can we put the customer needs first, while obviously also achieving our business goals? And not just putting the company need, the customer's needs first, but helping the customer feel that their needs are first. That's a very good point. So I think we might get, I hear, I hear we might be getting into some of our value proposition methodology at some point in this uh, podcast, yeah. which would be exciting. But one of the important things behind that methodology is understanding the difference between actual value and perceived value. And so this is our jobs as marketers and business people in the world. Like as a marketer, as a marketer, we are so fundamental to the entire operation of our economic system, Nathan, right? Our economic system is capitalism. And what does capitalism really mean? It means choice. So all of every other person who's employed right now, if you're working in a factory, if you're in product development, if you're delivering services, if you're driving a bus, whatever you're doing, the only reason you have that job is because of a marketer. So what companies do, what businesses do is they create value, right? They create all this actual value. It happens behind four walls. We don't see it happening. Customers don't even know what value it is. But what our job as marketers to do is communicate perceived value have the customer yes. perceive the value of what the company's creating. 
That's why we have content marketing. That's why we have all this other marketing we're doing. When we do that job well, a lot of people have jobs in our company, right? They're, they're building things, they're making things, they're developing things. We do that job poorly, the customer chooses someone else. So when we break it down, marketing is the vital role in society. And what the, the nuance of what you're saying here is very important. I want to make sure that the viewer, the listener understands this because this is very important. We can't just provide value to our customers. Our customer has to perceive the value we are providing. And those are two very different things. And it's a big mistake that, that I would say most companies make. They provide so much value to the customer that they don't even communicate to the customer effectively, that the customer doesn't even realize they're receiving. And as a result, it makes it a lot harder to make the sale. We've got to make sure that the customer can perceive all of the value that we are providing to them. Yeah, I'll give you two stories, two examples to get you thinking about this. At uh, one point in uh, my career, I worked in, in luxury real estate. And it's a very funny thing in luxury real estate that uh, the developers invest a whole heck of a lot of money in the sign in front of the development. And why do they do that? Well, there's a lot of factors that go into making a very nice luxury real estate development, right? Like how well is the home built? Is it up to code? Will it stand up to a hurricane? You know, do they have good amenities? Are, at Sunday at five o'clock, are they gonna have something for my grandkids to do if they're visiting? These are difficult questions to answer, but an easy question to answer when you're driving up is, do I see a really nice sign out front or not? So the funny thing is some of these developments, they have like Versailles <laughs> out front, this amazing sign, this amazing you know, sign that they develop in. So when people drive up, when I drive up, if I'm deciding to buy, or even more importantly, once I buy, when someone's driving up to visit me, right, they see and they think, wow, this is a really nice development. So one question you can ask for your own products, your own company, what is your sign out front? Is it your website? Is it, you know, the, 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 the um, free version of your course that you give, that, that first course? What is that sign out front that is an indication to the customer that this is the thing they're looking for, that this has a lot of value, that helps them perceive the value? Love uh, it. I want to give... Yeah, one other example real quick. Uh, this is research from uh, Michael Norton of Harvard. Uh, we, he, he spoke at our event before. We have uh, some interviews with him on our, on our website, Marketing Sherpa. And he did research into what he calls trust through transparency. So again, this comes down to value perception. A lot of times people just don't understand what went into making the product or service they're buying. So he gives an example of a locksmith, right? So the locksmith said early in his career, you know, someone got locked out of their house, he would go up to, to get them into their house, it would take him an hour, an hour and a half, he'd be sweating, he'd be, you know, try, he'd have to break down the door. And finally, after an hour and a half, he'd get them into their house. And he'd say, here's a bill for $150. And they'd say, here you go. Thank you very much. He said, as his career progressed, he got really good at it. He'd come up in two minutes, ding, ding, boop. you know, he'd figure out how to open it, opens the door, gives them a bill for $150. And they say, what am I paying for? <laughs> right? So the customer experience was actually better. You know, the second time, the doors are not getting broken down. They're getting into a house a lot quicker. However, they did not perceive the value in the same way because they did not see the value going into it. They didn't see his 20 years of experience. So another thing to think about if you're watching, if you're, you know, trying to monetize your content, how do you show all the experience, all that went into actually creating the content so customers and potential customers will perceive the value of that offering. Okay. I love this direction that we're going and thank you for sharing those examples. Let's just go ahead and dive right into that value proposition. Heuristic, you call it, um, the methodology for value proposition. Sure, so at a high level, just so you understand the background of this, uh, MechLabs Institute has patented methodologies uh, Flip McLaughlin, our founder, who's got over you know, three decades of research into customer behavior, has patented some methodologies based on our research to understand the factors that go into customer decisions. So one way I like to describe this is uh, right across the street from me is uh, Johnson & Johnson's AccuView Vistacon, and they make contact lenses. It's the worldwide headquarters, and they produce them there. They make contact lenses. So when I get a contact lens, you know, what, what is a good marketing conversion rate? If, 5%, 10%, 20%, you know, you're, you're really happy to get a 20% conversion rate, let's say on your landing page. Well, if I take out my contact lens and I only have a 20% conversion rate, only one out of five contact lenses work, that's a major failure. I'm not gonna keep wearing those contacts, right? And so those contact lenses have, let's say a 99.9999% conversion rate, right? When I take them out, I put it in, it works. 
How does Johnson and Johnson do that? It's not because they just have all stars on the manufacturing line every time. They just have this group of all stars who are just so good at manufacturing. It's because they have a consistent methodology to understand the factors that go into making a good contact lens, right? In marketing and sales and advertising, something I've always seen in my career is it's very variable, the performance. You know, some, some entrepreneurs, they have that golden gut. They get it for this thing. They don't get it for that thing. But they've never really broken down what are the factors that go into success. So that's where, you know, Flip McLaughlin created these heuristics, these thought tools. I'll briefly go over two real quick and we can dive as deep or go as high level as you want. Sure. So one of them, does that, does that make sense? The uh, methodology works? Sure. So one of them is called the conversion sequence heuristic. And I'm going to say it. You don't have to write it down. You don't have to memorize it. It's all over the web. You can find it everywhere. But just so you understand the factors, it's C equals 4M plus 3V plus 2I minus F minus 2A. And what those letters and numbers and pluses and minuses connote are the different elements that affect conversion. The one I want to dive into is the V is the force of the value proposition. So there are four elements that affect the force of the value proposition. And I think these are critical if you're looking at monetization, right? Because when you're looking to monetize, you've got to build a value proposition for that product. It's even more difficult when it's a digital product, right? When we can't just walk into a store, pick up a book, flip it around, you know, get kind of a feel for that value perception, we really need to make sure we're communicating that value proposition well through digital channels. So the four factors, and we could break down each of these. I know one is uh, one of your tectonic shifts too, Nathan, but. Uh, it's appeal, credibility, exclusivity, and clarity. So again, okay. appeal, credibility, exclusivity, and clarity. And so when you're looking at creating the value proposition for product, you have to ask, how do I rank on these four different factors to a customer? Will you talk through what those four are and what they mean and maybe give some examples if you could? That would be, yeah, let's, let's break those down. So first is appeal. So appeal, this I think probably makes sense to a lot of entrepreneurs a lot of marketers, a lot of business people, right? Am I creating something that's appealing? If you went one through five and looked at you know, what you're creating, is it appealing? So for example, I don't have a lot of hair in my head. <laughs> if you said I have a magic potion, rub it on your head, all of a sudden you'll get this thick luscious, like if I get Nathan's hair overnight just by rubbing that on my head, that would be very appealing to me, right? That would be on a scale of one to five. So one of the first things you have to ask, and again, a lot of, a lot of companies are, this is, this is where they're, they're doing it is, you know, have I created something that has appeal in the marketplace? One challenge sometimes that uh, companies and, and entrepreneurs face, especially entrepreneurs I've noticed, startups, is they look for kind of shards of hope that, that what they're creating has appeal. So niche products can be very profitable, can be very high margin. I'm sure, Nathan, you can speak into that when, when we're talking about monetization. But the question you really have to ask is, how big is that niche and is it big enough to monetize? Do I need to expand it some? So for example, something I hear from startups all the time is these shards of hope where they talk to a potential investor or they talk to a potential customer and they just hear this one element, oh, they liked it, oh, they thought it was so good, oh, oh, they're very excited. So you have to understand where you're getting your data and information from if something is appealing. So if you're talking, if you're a startup, if you're a entrepreneur at first, you're talking to uh, people in your, in your network, you're talking to friends and family, uh, you're talking to you know, potential investors, you have to ask, do they really want to give you bad news, right? We talked about being passionate in the beginning of this. If you're walking in, you're all passionate about your product. What is the cost and value for them to say, that's stupid, I don't like it. You know, they'll find something they like about it, great, and go ahead. We have to really ask is, are you getting a conversion? Are they investing? Are they purchasing? What are they doing? So step back and say, am I only getting information about the appeal of my product through anecdotal means, or can I find ways to test and experiment? Once you start having a budget, you can test, for example, if you don't, uh, it's great if you actually are an established business, you have an email list, you have website traffic coming in. You, know, you can do some A-B testing. If you don't, you might want to look at doing you know, Google PPC ads, Facebook ads, some of these different ads to actually test the appeal, see if you're getting engagement, see if you're getting click through see if you're getting actual purchases on this, you know, running these pilots before you invest too heavily into a product. Uh, you know, other things you can do is, is you know, some different background research. You can conduct surveys. Uh, it's great with social media, tools like Yelp, uh, forums for your specific industry, Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, looking and seeing, is this a consistent problem? For example, a case study we're about to launch, is probably going to come out in about a month from uh, Marketing Sherpa, was a company that had a product for office managers. Um, it's a big, you know, they're trying to figure out what, what do we need to, to make for office managers. They're trying to make a platform 
that would be appealing. So what they did is they looked at the top Facebook groups that office managers joined. They joined like, you know, 10 or 15 of these groups. And then they created a matrix of here are the five to 10 problems that office managers are talking about in these groups. And so once they had that matrix, they could clearly see there was a consistent pattern that they were able to discover. And then they were able to make that software product, that platform solve those products. And that's how they understood they had an appealing value proposition for that software platform. Okay, so the next one, and this is one of your tectonic shifts, so feel free to add in your own thoughts on this, is, is credibility. So again, if David came to me and he said, I've got the cure for baldness, you put this on your head, it's gonna look just like my head, high in appeal, but what's the credibility, right? I wanna know what are your scientific bona fides? How, why and how does this actually work? So credibility we found is a place very, very many value propositions are lacking. So previously in my career that we talked about, I've worked as a copywriter. And so when you work as a copywriter for an advertising agency, sometimes you're in conference rooms, you know, boardrooms with clients and they get all excited and talk all about, okay, here's what we do and that's what we do. We've got these features and benefits, boom, put it in there, copywriter. If you are a copywriter, I say to you, you have to be an advocate for the customer. All marketers have to be advocates for the customer. It's very easy to get in these meetings and have group think and say, oh yes, this is amazing. This is the most wonderful thing ever. Well, you can buy that ad and say, you know, the most amazing, wonderful thing ever. That's great. You can pay the money. You can, you know, a TV station will sell it to you, a newspaper will sell it to you. But the question you have to really ask is, will any customer believe you? How can you add credibility to what you are doing? So and that's where things, and you know, you can speak to it as, as well, Nathan, is, you know, having some third party certifications, having customer reviews, having testimonials, talking about when we talked about the perceived value, sometimes it's just a matter of showing that process more. So if the, uh, you know, guy looking to open the, if the locksmith looking to open the door walked up and he said, before he even went to open the door, he said, okay, just so you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. And I found out a simple process to unlock this in two minutes by doing bip, bap, and boom. He's like, or I could take an hour and a half to break down your door. You know, which would you rather I do? And when he's kind of explaining that process, again, that builds up credibility. This is where content marketing can come in. So it's one thing to say, uh, here, here's another uh, kind of a case study we talked about before. Uh, there's some organic eggs that were sold in um, the grocery store and they cost six bucks a dozen or something. I don't know. They're, they're expensive. I don't you know, remember the price. And so they have to have some credibility. What is behind it that makes it more expensive? And so what they actually do, I thought it was so sweet and clever, is they have a newsletter attached to each of their egg cartons. And it goes through and it talks about the chickens by name. And it talks about how this chicken likes roaming around on this farm here and all this stuff. And you know what are they essentially doing? They're showing the process to build credibility behind the value of those eggs have higher perceived value. So my book what have you thought? humanizing but they're okay. humanizing the chickens. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll tell you a place where humanizing can, can uh, really come in too is with uh, any complex technology product. So sometimes we like to uh, show the credibility of our technology products by just throwing what we call GORP. Have people ever hear the term GORP? Just all these complex words. So when you're selling something like technology, selling to a bigger, bigger company, you have to realize there's different people you're selling to. There's the influencer and there's a the purchaser. So for the influencer, some of those people that are very into the you know, technology, that you might be speaking their language. You might be building credibility with them. But for some of these end purchasers who might be on the business end and aren't as technical, you have to ask, how can you humanize a product? How can you show them what it does? And how can you do that with credibility? Yeah. So that, that's appeal and credibility. So let's talk about exclusivity. Again, this is, this is another uh, area where some companies are challenged. So, it's great to have an appealing product and it's great for people to believe it. But if everyone else has it, you're not gonna sell at a higher margin. You would call that a commodity, right? So if you're selling me the cure for baldness and everyone else sells it, well, I'm, I'm just gonna look at price shopping. So you have to look at when you're building the value proposition for your product, you know, for example, if you're looking to you know, monetize your knowledge of copywriting, <laughs> let's say, and you're looking to build a course and sell you know, your course on copywriting, well, there's a thousand courses on copywriting. So you have to ask is what is the exclusivity that you bring to it that no one else does? You know, you might not, so if you ranked your exclusivity from one to five, it might not be a hundred percent exclusive, but is there something you can do to make it more exclusive? So I'll give you an example. And this is where you kind of have to sometimes balance out the niche offering of your product with having a big, big enough addressable uh, market. Um, I got a pitch once 
uh, from a copywriter from a, she had a small marketing boutique agency and her focus was on tea, specifically the tea industry, very focused on the tea industry. So she sold herself as is the most knowledgeable copywriter for the tea industry, tea bags and, you know, tea cups and tea mugs, all that stuff. So yeah. if, if, you know, you, if you found that's a big enough niche, that is a way to build exclusivity versus just saying, I'm a really good copywriter and there's a million other copywriters in the world. I love it. So you're saying, in essence, we need to we need to figure out where we can be number one in the world. We need to figure out what differentiates us, and not not try to sell a commodity that that lots of other people are selling. I, in my book, I use an example of potatoes. I live in Idaho, where there's potato farmers. There's potato farms everywhere, and you buy a big box of potatoes here, and it costs five bucks for you know massive box of potatoes, but but if like I was in New York City in Times Square and I went to Five Guys Potatoes uh, or a Five Guys um, restaurant and uh, they put they have those signs up on the wall where they say where their potatoes were from that day for their fries. And it said Rexburg, Idaho, where I was from. And so Five Guys, the Five Guys franchise owner in New York City in Times Square had been able to figure out how to take the commodity from Rexburg, Idaho and turn it into a premium product, a Five Guys French fry that he could sell for a lot more money. He could sell for more money per French fry almost than what it costs to buy the whole box of potatoes here in Rexburg. So. Yeah, that's a great example. He created a value added service, but also he understood his target customer. So the customer was very different in Idaho, <laughs> right? Where the potatoes were a commodity, Versus bringing it over to, uh, like you said, in Times Square and, and making it themselves. So that really also, to your point, gets to customer understanding. What is exclusive and appealing to one customer is not going to be to another customer. And so really finding a way to put the customer first and to find that target customer is crucial. Yeah, love it. Okay, keep going. Uh, so the last element is clarity. So it could be great. You could have the most appealing, the most exclusive product, totally credible. But if you don't clearly communicate it, if you don't clearly communicate this value, then it's not really gonna to matter to the customer. So again, remembering what our goal is, the mountain we're trying to climb is value perception, getting a customer to perceive the value of an offering. And many times, uh, you know, I was an advertising copywriter. I am creative by nature. I love creativity. Uh, but what creativity does in advertising and marketing is it gets someone's attention, right? Then what we have to do is convert that attention to interest and actually get them to purchase. And sometimes when we overdo these things to get their attention, we're not gonna convert it to interest because we're not gonna clearly communicate the value. So you have to think about how can I clearly communicate that value? So here's one example, uh, MechLabs Institute, which is the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa, we work directly with companies to help them understand their customers better, to improve their conversion, ultimately improve revenue. We're working with a company that sells data, like a data broker essentially. And uh, their headline on their landing page was uh, looking for the most uh, I think it was looking for the most accurate data, your search is over, your hunt is over, something like that. So that's appealing. If you're looking to buy data, obviously you want accurate data, but is it very credible or clear? So would I believe it? Do I clearly understand why? And so when our team of analysts was working on that landing page, and this is something we call buried value, it's the buried treasure that all, many companies have. Um, we found down at the bottom, it turns out that they made sure to call every single contact they had in their database every three months or something like that. And so we, we took that little piece of information from the bottom, which was very clear for the value they offered. That was the exclusive value they offered in the marketplace. And we made that the headline. And it was something like, you know, we make, you know, 8 million hours of calls every year. So, uh, you know, so our data is reliable. Right? So that's a lot clearer than just saying, looking for the most reliable data, your search is over. And because of that, you know, they, got, they got a huge lift in conversion. So one thing I advise, if you're you know, a marketer, a copywriter, you're working in an agency, you, know, you really got to sometimes hunt through uh, what the company is communicating to look for that, that buried value, that hidden treasure. Sometimes it's buried in a landing page. Sometimes it's on the about page. Uh, one example, I was working with a company that had a very exclusive and unique patent. And when you talk to the business folks, they're very excited, hype it up, world changing, world beating. It's going to be amazing, which sure it will, right? But, but you know, I, I don't understand why or how. And they actually had an interview with the researcher who developed this patent in Oxford or Cambridge, it was somewhere in the UK. It was this 10-minute interview where the guy actually goes through and explains it. 
And once I saw that, the light bulb went off like, oh, okay, I understand how it works now. And then you can clearly communicate it to a customer and clearly communicate that value versus again, just say, I mean, how, how often have we seen this? Scalable software, right? The best technology, world-class, a leading company. Like we've seen all those words so many times that they become what I call blandvertising. I like to use the example of North Korean propaganda. So if you've ever seen North Korean propaganda, You've seen that, you know, the dear leader had the first time he golfed, had like 10 holes in one or something like that. And all of these kind of ridiculous claims. They can make those claims, but if you don't clearly understand how they're true, again, the customer's not going to believe any of it. Thank you so much, Daniel, for sharing your stories and knowledge with us today. Here are some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, if we don't put our customers first, they won't put us first. Number two, if there's one question we have to ask, It's how can we put the customer's needs first while also achieving our business goals? Number three, it's important to show our customers all the work and experience that went into creating our content so they can perceive the value we're offering. Number four, to make sure our products have exclusivity, we need to ask what is the exclusivity that we bring to this niche that no one else does? Number five, What is exclusive and appealing to one customer is not going to be to another customer. That's why it's important to identify and target our ideal customers. If you enjoyed this interview and want to learn more about Daniel or connect with him, you can find him on LinkedIn or visit the Mech Labs website at mechlabs.com. And there's links to both of those sites on the blog for this episode. Did you like today's episode? then please follow these channels to receive free digital monetization content. Number one, you can get a free monetization assessment of your business and subscribe to the free monetization e-magazine at monetizationnation.com. Number two, please subscribe to the Monetization Nation podcast and YouTube channel. And number three, please connect with me, Nathan William, on LinkedIn. How do you help your customers perceive the value of your products and services. Please join our private Monetization Nation Facebook group and share your insights with other digital monetizers. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I wish you success in your customer first marketing. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.